Let's stand and open with 512. Very familiar song. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come from the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children. You have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. But this we know, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. 
If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have a boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also.
discussing the perfections of God, last time we discussed the love of God uh, from 1 John 4, 21. 1 John 4, 7 to 21, uh, uh, we considered the perfections, the perfection, the proof, and the practice of the love of God. And today I want to return to 1 John 4, 7 to 21. Uh, uh, you know, I talk a lot about John, John MacArthur, but uh, had, uh, along with other resources that I have, been uh, using his resources, his uh, commentary on First John, and then a book that I read that he wrote 20 years ago, I'm rereading it, um, called The Love of God, and uh, very interesting. Um, and I, was, I saw a note somewhere and it said, uh, uh, The God Who Loves, I said, oh, we got another one, let me go on the internet, what I, I mean the Amazon, what I found out was they had just changed the title. And then I had to go through the table of contents because what, what they do to get you to buy a, new, uh, a, a revised book is they add a chapter or something like that. So I went through the table of contents for this and the one I saw and there was no change. So I said, I don't have to buy it. <laughs> and I get in trouble with Carol. <laughs> uh, but uh, <clears throat> trying to work my way back through that as we talk about this topic, which we're going to cover for uh, some time. And even today, Teresa, I'm not sure. But uh, this may be a two-parter. Because uh, I, I thought I wrote it, and then I started getting down to the final part, and I just started just condensing stuff. And like, oh, why am I crunching all this in? Why do I got to rush through it? Because this is an extensive passage. And uh, in one sense, we're going to go through it, but not as finely as I would normally do. Uh, but I do want to look at it, and as we look at it, 1 John 4, 7 through 21, uh, I want to discuss five reasons why Christians love. So the subtitle that you have on your insert, five reasons why Christians love. Five reasons why Christians love. We said last time that John writes his epistle to call Christians back to the, to the basics of Christianity. John, in this epistle, cycles uh, through three uh, themes. Uh, they are sound doctrine, obedience, and love. So these three sub-themes uh, uh, recur in the book. Uh, he goes over them uh, uh, multiple times as he's talking about uh, Christian basics and what it means to be a Christian and how you demonstrate that you truly are a saved individual. Uh, through uh, holding to sound doctrine, through uh, obedience to the commandments of God, not in order to be saved, but as a demonstration that you are saved and in a right relationship with God. And then uh, through the exercise uh, of love that demonstrates uh, uh, the truth that God is love. Uh, so <clears throat> he's, he discusses love uh, one of the first uh, places he discussed it, if you turn to chapter 2, and um, uh, uh, one of the discussions here is in chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. He says, <clears throat> Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passed away, the true light is already shining. Verse 9, he who says he is in the light, uh, and that theme started back in chapter 1, uh, where he says God is light in chapter 1, verse 5, and he's talking about the issue of fellowship. So he says, he who says he is in the light and hates his brothers in the darkness until now. Uh, and again, uh, our former pastor used to always, Pastor Payne used to always say, uh, Christianity is a, is a do faith and not a say faith. All right? This individual says, he says he's in the light, but what he does is he hates his brother, and John says he's still in the dark. He's not in the light, no matter what he says, because what he's doing doesn't uh, validate what he has claimed. Verse 10, he who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. 
But he who hates his brothers in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And so uh, John discusses love here and presents love as a proof of true fellowship. You see, because what he's saying back in chapter 1 is God is light. And if we're having fellowship with God, we're walking in the light. Uh, we're not walking in the darkness uh, um, uh, because God is light. And so the reality of our uh, relationship with God is demonstrated in our relationship to those who are believers. He says, so if we love them, uh, verse 10, he who loves his brother, you abide in the light. You do really have fellowship with God. So his first discussion is about the reality of fellowship with God, the reality that you're in the right relationship with God and fellowship with him because you love. And then secondly, uh, he talks about love in chapter 3 and uh, verse 10. Let's start there. Uh, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Who, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Okay? You don't practice righteousness, you don't love your brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should what? Love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. So verse 13, he says, Do not marvel, my brother, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we, what? Love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But who, whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? And then uh, verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. This is more than talk. It has to be actual uh, deed. So his focus here in 1 John 3, 10 to 18, he discusses love as evidence of a believer's sonship. The fact that you are loving demonstrates that you are a son of God. You are a child of God. You really do belong to God. Because to hate is to belong to the wicked one, to belong to Satan. That's who Cain belonged to. And therefore, he demonstrated that he belonged to him because he murdered his brother Abel. And of course, Jesus said in John 8, 44, that Satan is a murderer. He's the father of all lies, and he's a murderer. And what does he want to do? He wants to kill you and I. Okay, so, uh, and then of course we highlight verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brother. One of the proofs for ourselves that we are a genuine believer, a Christian, is that we love other Christians. So, you know, I love Christians, but I hate going to church. Really? I love Christians, but I just can't stand to be around the people. They always talk about the Lord. Really? No, you don't know the Lord. You, you hang out with the people you love. Okay? So people who claim to be Christians, well, you know, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to be, I don't have to, no, wait a minute. That's a contradiction in terms. Because we know that we have passed from death unto life because, because what? We love the brethren. Listen, if you don't look forward to coming to church, if you see it more as a duty than as a desire that has grown out of your relationship with God, then something's not right. Once I got saved in 1976, nobody had to force me to go to church. I wanted to be around Christians because now I was one. Oh, I grew up in the church. I got a certificate from 1958, BBS, <laughs> when I was six years old, or whatever I was. 
I think John was a teenager then. Hey. But anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, but they may have shared the gospel with me in VBS. I might have heard it in church, but I had never accepted Christ as my Savior until till 1976. And then uh, I remember my mother made us go to church as kids. But when we got to teenage years and with all of her responsibilities now as a single parent taking care of three kids, her grip loosened a little bit. And one of my uncles who had taken us to Sunday school uh, was supposed to be holding her hands or something. And my sister stepped off and a car ran over her foot. And uh, she had these lumps on her foot for years. And I think after that, my mother wasn't letting <laughs> the, the uncle take us to the Sunday school. The church anymore. I think that that ended right there. Uh, but she started losing the grip. So by the time we got to you know teenagers, 13, 14, 15, something like that, we weren't going as regularly. She working two jobs now because she's got to support three kids, and the grip loosened something. Hey, you went Easter to show off your new clothes, and you might have went Christmas. T and A, T and A, T and A, C and E. C and E, Christmas and Easter. Christmas and Easter, yeah, C and E. But, so, you know, but then once I got saved, man, there's this desire to learn the Word of God, to be around the people of God. Uh, there's a difference when you become a Christian. If any man be in Christ, he's a like, Listen, you're not the same person you were. That doesn't mean everything has been worked out in your life because you grow in grace. Okay? But there's a new desire. And there's a love for others. And so, uh, in this passage, he discusses love as evidence of a believer's sonship. Now, um, in the passage before us, if you can go back to 4, starting in verse 7, uh, John discusses love again in light of the perfect Trinitarian love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and gives five reasons why Christians love. Uh, I was reading MacArthur's book, and he made this note. Augustine was considered the greatest theologian of the first thousand years of the church. Uh, he did have some doctrines, which I, uh, he, I believe he was an Augustinian, and I don't, didn't agree with his eschatology, but he was a tremendous, and he was the theologian that uh, he lived about the 5th century, 4th, 5th century, something like that. But it was uh, a thousand years later almost when Luther and Calvin and them came on the scene. And his theology was the basis of uh, uh, that they went to and, and then recovering the gospel and, and uh, uh, pr promoting the uh, Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. So. Uh, I was reading MacArthur, he made this quote. He says, God is love is so profound that no less than Augustine saw it as an important evidence of the doctrine of the Trinity. Because Augustine said that uh, God has been practicing love and love always goes toward another person. And so he says, this is evidence of the doctrine of the Trinity because within the Trinity there is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they have been loving each other throughout all eternity. Uh, and I thought that was a very interesting point and thought to consider uh, as a way to, to, as an evidence of the doctrine of the Trinity. And so I make this statement that in this passage, uh, uh, John discusses love again in light of the perfect Trinitarian love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he gives five reasons why Christians love. Why do we love and why should we love? And the answer, because God is love. Verse 8, God is love. And we talked about that last week and just a few of the things we noted. God is love. God is love is the biblical statement, the theological truth is that God is the source of love. All true love emanates from God because God is love. It is the well-known Greek word agape, 
And agape uh, is love that is self-sacrificing. It is a love that meets needs. It is love that is active. It is love that is action-oriented, as <coughs> indicated in 1 Corinthians 13. Let me go there real quick. You're familiar with the passage. But 1 Corinthians 13 uh, is a description of love. Uh, some have argued the definition. I, I <coughs> tend to go with the descriptive uh, idea. And in the Greek text, uh, <coughs> these are verbs and uh, indicating actions, uh, not just states. So in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. A whole lot of people have a problem with thinking no evil right now. I'll just leave it at that especially with this Supreme Court thing going on, uh, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then the first part of verse 8 says, love never fails. That's a agape love. It's active. It's action-oriented. It's directed towards someone else. It's not self-seeking. And it is not mainly emotional. As the world portrays love, it's always this emotion. It's always almost exclusively emotions and something that you fall into. And uh, of course, one of my favorite songs, uh, back uh, when he originally sang it, Little Anthony and the Imperials, uh, I'm going out of my head, <laughs> right? But love is not irrational. <laughs> but that's how we put it. I, I, I've fallen in love and then I fall out of it. No, it's agape love is volitional. It starts in the will. It's an action that you determine to take toward meeting the need of someone else. Uh, we're not denying that there's an emotional element to it, but the predominant idea in agape love is that it is action directed towards someone in need and meeting that need. Of course, the greatest example of that, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. You cannot love God's love without giving to meet the need of someone else. Uh, it's impossible, and it's not emotionally based. You, that may come into play, but it, it's volitional. It's I determine to meet your need. So John says in verse 7, Beloved, let us, what? Love one another. Uh, just stop there for a minute. Love one another. You see it in verse 7. Uh, you see it in verse 11. You see it in verse 12. And it's implied in verse 21. <clears throat> and so this becomes a, a major focus to love one another. So, so John says in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Loving demonstrates that we are, as he says in the rest of verse 7, born of God and we know God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Can't practice hate and be born of God. Those who do not love do not know God. It's just as simple as that. That's what he's declaring here. Those who do not love 
do not know God. They have no relationship with God despite what they say. Why? Again, verse 8, God is love. And again, we're not talking about sentimentality and emotionalism but a determination to meet the need of someone else. Uh, it sounds a little bit like the Nathans went over and, and helped encourage uh, a devil meeting a need. Uh, and uh, we heard last week, uh, Doc Ann needed a ride to the concert. Uh, I'm sure Teresa did, ooh, I got goosebumps thinking about taking Doc Ann on a ride. I don't think that's how it happened. And she said, you know what, Doc Ann wants to go to the concert. I'm going to the concert. Let me pick Doc Ann up. That was a, that was a volitional act. That was a, a determination of her will to do something. And she was meeting a need uh, that Doc Ann had to get to the concert. She wasn't, you know, having goosebumps. She made a decision to meet a need. NCBC, God is love, explains several things in a biblical worldview. So that's what we see in verse 8. He says, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So God is love explains several things in a biblical worldview. First, God is love explains the reason God created God is love explains the reason why God created. Believers, you see, are a love gift of the Father to the Son. Turn over to John chapter 6. And I was going to run through these things, Teresa, but I'm going to take my time. Good. That's why we're going to do a part two. <laughs> I decided not to just run through these things. But look at John chapter 6 and verse 39. Uh, uh, I'll just start at 38. Jesus says, um, well, let me back up to 37. Oh, I'll back up to 35. It's, it's all good. <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard jumping in the middle of a, of, of a, of a chapter or a passage or something. Uh, so Jesus said in 35 this famous statement, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. And you come to me shall never harm you, and he shall who believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. When did he give it to him? Before eternity. Before eternity. Uh, I, I mean eternity past, before the world was created. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This of uh, 39 is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should, not lo I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Again, what I want you to see and understand here is Jesus declares that uh, um, all those that uh, will be saved, all those that uh, come to him and are saved, all of those individuals, the Father gave to him. They were a love gift from the Father to the Son. And so God created in order that he might give this gift to his Son. This gift of those that he had already determined were going to come to his Son and believe on him and be saved. And so in John 17, just turn over, flip over to John 17. Of course, John 17 is Jesus' high priestly prayer, right? Mm -hmm. It's the real Lord's prayer, if you will. Uh, John 17, all 26 verses. He's praying uh, uh, what we call the Lord's prayer. It's really, uh, John MacArthur calls it the disciples' prayer. Uh, it's a model for us to use because it's a prayer Jesus would never pray. Why? Because he, he never had to ask forgiveness for sin. Because he never sinned. So he would never pray what we call the Lord's prayer because he, he never sinned. You and I sin all the time, right? So we need to pray that. Look, uh, forgive us our, our trespasses or forgive us our sins. But Jesus would never pray that because he never sinned. Well, anyway, John 17, pick it up at verse 9. I pray for them. Who's he talking about? 
believers. Okay. Notice the next statement. I do not pray for the world, unbelievers, but for those whom you have what? Given, Given me. See, he's praying for the ones that the Father gave to him. All right? For they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me. See, all believers are, are a gift from the Father to the Son. See? You and I were a gift from the Father to the Son. That's why we believe us. Okay? That they may be one as we are one. While I was in, in uh, while I was with them in the world, I, I kept them in your name. Those who you gave, gave me, I have. He what? Kept. He kept. Very important. You worry about losing your salvation? Mm -mm, sorry. <laughs> All that the Father gave him, he does what? He keeps. He keeps. He, he, he didn't say nothing about you about keeping. He, he said, I keep. Amen. Uh, you know everybody stronger than Jesus? Yes. I don't know. He keeps. That ought to encourage your heart today. Uh, he keeps. Uh, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition. Of course, that's a reference to Judas. Right? That the scripture might be fulfilled. See, all of this is fulfilling the scripture. All right? Verse 13, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one. Now he will come and take us out, that's the rapture, but right now he's praying that God keeps us from the evil one destroying us. And so Jesus is serving in his high priestly ministry now in heaven. He intercedes for you and me. He's in heaven praying for us. And when the, the evil one comes and accuses us because we've sinned, Jesus said, I paid for that sin. And God says, okay, forgive me. Uh, because Jesus is there now interceding for you and I. And so uh, God is love explains the reason God created. Believers are a love gift of the Father to the Son. So God created man whom he could love and redeem. That's why he created man. Listen, God knew what was going to happen before he created man. Nothing caught God by surprise. What happened in the garden didn't catch him by surprise. God already uh, had formulated his plan and what he was going to do. Now I know it's hard for a lot of people to believe this. I want to get more, but uh, we'll talk about does God love everybody at some point. But let me tell you this, you already know it. Everybody's not going to heaven. You do know that, right? You have read the Bible. Everybody's not going. God didn't choose everybody. Uh, and uh, we'll get to the doctrine of election at some point. But uh, he did create man. And he loves man, and he has provided a redeemer for man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you and I, if we are saved today, if we're believers, we have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. That was God's plan. And so he had to create us in order to carry that out. He couldn't carry that out if we weren't here. You see what I'm saying? So uh, God is love explains creation. And especially the creation of man. Because he had already devised a plan that he was going to redeem a portion of mankind. And I don't know about you, but hallelujah, what a savior, because I'm part of that redeemed group. I ain't mad because everybody ain't redeemed. I'm so thankful that he redeemed me. Amen. Because God is not obligated to save any of us. Right. None of us deserve heaven. Just go read Romans 3. 10 to 17 again. In case you get you forget. And, and you know, you run into these people who say, you know, I'm basically a good person. Well, take them to Romans 10. Romans 3, let them read 10 to 17, what God says about us. There's none righteous. No, no not one. 
mean, that kind of takes in everybody. But of course, we forget that real fast. Because what we're always comparing ourselves with is what? Somebody else. God says, no, the comparison is not between uh, 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 Jeff and, and, and Tyrone. The comparison is between Jeff and me and Tyrone and me. And since God's perfect, all of us fall short, right? Romans 3.23. Second, God's love explains human choice. God's love explains human choice. God gave man the ability to choose. He gave man a will. And God wills that man will choose him. But you know and understand biblically that man only wills to choose God because of the convicting work of the Spirit of God. All right? So look at uh, John 7. John 7. And uh, two verses there, 17 and 18. I'll start at 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills, see that? If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of one who sent him is true and no one righteous in him. So Jesus says, if anyone wills, if anyone chooses to do his will, he will know. And of course, you and I, because of our sinfulness, we need the convicting work of the Holy Spirit to enable us to choose God. Because you, in John 15, 16, what did Jesus say to the disciples? You didn't choose me, but I chose you. I chose you. So why did you choose God? Why did I choose God? Why has any believer ever chosen God? You know why? Because God chose us first. Amen. And then through the Holy Spirit and his regenerating work, he gave us the capacity to choose him. Because what was our status? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead people can't do anything. If a dead person gets out of the casket at the funeral, I suggest you run. Okay? Because something ain't right for that picture. Okay? So everybody, and this is hard for people to grasp, everybody that is born into this world is physically alive, but spiritually dead. And, 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 and just, I was on the right here. The guy was doing some review about the, the program, The Walking Dead, has been on for nine years, and they said, the audience has sort of decreased, they probably need to stop. I just thought, it's this fascination with zombies. But it's a perfect illustration of people's spiritual condition before God. They're the walking dead. They, they got breath, physical breath, but spiritually, they are dead to God. And it's just interesting, in our culture today, this fascination with the zombies. I was upset. I, went, I like Brad Pitt, so I went to see, a, a, I don't know how many years ago, I went to see World War Z. Come to find out about zombies. I'm like, oh man, I spent my money to do a zombie movie. I was so <laughs> upset. I'm not into zombies. I mean, when they made that original one back in the 1960s, the Night of the Living Dead or whatever, you know, scared you to death, and you said, I ain't gonna never watch that again. But this current fascination with zombies, I, I had no interest in them, and when I went to see them, I was so, oh man, I spent my money, couldn't get my money back. Uh, but this culture is fascinated with it, but as I've looked at it over the years and thought about it, it's a perfect illustration of what people, people's spiritual condition is. They have physical life and they're spiritually separated from God. They're the walking dead. And unless they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will continue to be the walking dead. And the only reason anybody can choose God is will to do his will is because God has to enable them to do it. God has to enable, and that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the convicting, uh, regenerating, uh, 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 empowering work of the Holy Spirit in the life of believers. Listen, you and I didn't come to Christ because we were religious. You and I didn't come to Christ because we were smart. You and I didn't come to Christ because we were American, or female, or male, or uh, we had lived such a good life. We came to Christ because the hope, 
we heard the gospel, the Holy Spirit convicted us of our sin and enabled us to choose Christ. And what we found out was that when we made that choice for Christ, was that God had chosen us first. Uh, I'm jumping ahead to verse 19 of chapter 4. We love him because he first loved us. I mean, don't, don't get the cart before the horse. You see? It was because of God first. All right? Uh, three. God is love explains the providence of God. Why do the things that happen in your life happen? Why do the things that happen in my life happen? Well, John 3.16, of course, is the most well-known verse in the Bible, but Romans 8.28, not too far behind. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and to them that are called according to His purpose. For whom He did predestinate, He also... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Before whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. And so, uh, we know that since we have been a Christian, God has been working everything together for our good. Doesn't mean everything that happens to us is good. It means that he works it together for our good. We who love the Lord. And of course we love him because he first loved us. So God is love is the reason, explains the providence of God in the life of the believer. It explains the providence of God and why what's going on is going on. Because God has a purpose and a plan and he's working toward that. No, he's not opening up heaven and dropping manna down. But listen to me, you pray to God, God I need some food, God will get the food to you. Because he takes care of those who belong to him. He just simply says this, Matthew 5, seek ye first. first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall, yeah. that's the promise of God. So what is our responsibility? Put God first. Put God first. Put God first. He'll meet every need that you have, every need, not every want, but he'll meet every need, every legitimate need you and I have. He will meet. He just says, make me the priority. That's what uh, the first of the Ten Commandments is about, right? Have no other God before God, which includes yourself. So what is our society fascinated with, Gwen? Let me take a selfie. Oh, I need another selfie. Oh, I need another selfie. I need a, I mean, we selfie in. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's just interesting to me that everybody's into selfies now. A little bit of deification going on, maybe. I don't know. I don't know what's in people's minds, but I can tell you, people's hearts are desperately wicked, so I wouldn't be surprised if, you know what, we didn't replay. Well, I used to like that football player. Hey, listen, I'm taking a selfie. <laughs> and posting it on, it on on Facebook and the internet and everything else. I want y'all to see me. You know? It's just a fascination in American culture, probably it's around the world, I don't know. But uh and then fourth, God is love explains the divine plan of redemption. God is love explains the divine plan of redemption. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have. Listen, God is love explains that. For God so loved the world that he gave. God is love explains the divine plan of redemption. So, that's reason one, and we're going to stop there. Reason one for why Christians love. We love, first of all, because God is love. God is the source of love. And God calls us to love one another. Father in heaven, thank you for your holy word and what we've discussed this morning. And I just pray your blessings uh, as we uh, reflect upon the truth that God is love and the implications of that for our, our lives. As those who claim to be Christian, that we will demonstrate that uh, 
we love you because we love one another. We will demonstrate that we are born of God, that we know you because we do love one another. And so bless us as congregation of people. We hear the words of Jesus echoing our heart and mind uh, that when we love one another, uh, his new commandment, uh, that this becomes a testimony to those who are outside and a way of, of uh, gospelizing them uh, through our actions and including the message uh, of salvation. Bless now as we transition to the Lord's Supper. And we thank you again for our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank the Lord for the opportunity to remember his death for us at Calvary. And we praise the Lord that the death was uh, confirmed because they buried him. But uh, he did not stay there. On the third day, he rose from the dead. And now he gives life to all who repent of their sins and trust him as their Lord and Savior. And uh, I trust that that includes all that are here today. Uh, and so we have participated in this to acknowledge him and what he did, to give thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ for what he did. And as John said in his prayer, to look forward to his coming again. Um, so as bad as it gets, and as old as some of us get, <laughs> teenager, teenager. <laughs> uh, we have the hope that he's coming back. And uh, uh, one preacher said, I'm not looking for the undertaker, I'm looking for the uppertaker. <laughs> and another pastor said, I know uh, uh, I got to die, but you're going to have to fight me to get me in that casket. <laughs> I said, I'm fighting all the way to you and, and fight to close that lid. Uh, Jesus may come in our lifetime. It's exciting. We, we don't know. We stay away from predictions. Like so many people have fallen into that trap. But we are to live as Paul did in his day and as every generation should have since then, we're to live with the expectation that he could come in our lifetime. So we want to be faithful to him. We want to continue to honor him. We want to continue to live for him. So let's stand to be dismissed. Again, I'm thankful to, to God for each one of you. Uh, I was praying again for uh, each one in our church family this morning before I came, asking God's blessings upon you and uh, praying that the service would be an encouragement and a challenge to you, and always it's, it's wonderful to come together to fellowship with other believers, people who uh, love the same Savior that you love, and, and you can talk freely about the things of God and not be uh, put down, shunned, uh, um, and all of the other things that we experience when we talk to people who are just religious or just flat out atheistic, uh, because they don't want to hear about the things of God. And so I'm thankful for every opportunity we get together. Of course, we'll meet again on Wednesday. So uh, we'll, we'll come together and pray. And John will lead the Bible study in 1 Thessalonians. And uh, I encourage you to come and be a part of that. So let's pray and dismiss. Uh, and uh, may God bless you the rest of the day. Father in heaven, thank you for our time together today. Thank you for each one that has come today. We just pray that you will bless and continue to bless our lives and that we would be a blessing to others. May we, because we uh, know the biblical truth that God is love and we understand some of the theological implications of that, uh, that, that you are the source of all love and because uh, you have given us your love, we can love one another and then that can expand outwards to others. May we do that this week and bring glory and honor to you. So bless us now as we dismiss and Go to our homes or in other places, and may we have uh, enjoy the rest of our day today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is that right? Tomorrow's your birthday? Hey, everybody's attention real quick.
Get everybody's attention real quick. Let's sing happy birthday to Anaya. Her birthday tomorrow. Oh, yes. Yeah, come on. Happy, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Anaya. May the good Lord bless you. Now tell everybody how old you're going to be tomorrow. I'm going to be four. Four? Man, that's like ancient, isn't it? <laughs> Happy birthday! <laughs> Get your mother to open up her wallet. Wow! <laughs> and grandma and grandpa and auntie. <laughs> four, uh, four. Buddy. Four. Uh, four. See ya. Yeah, I think we're okay. I think we got enough coffee. Yeah, I think we're okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.